Hello, welcome to Chapter 8, Homework Questions 49 through 54. Question 49. Factor the following uh, polynomials. On part A, we have x squared minus 64. This is a difference of squares, so we don't need to do the generic rectangle if we remember the pattern. We have x minus 8 and x plus 8. Remember, with a difference of squares, each one of these terms need to be a perfect square, which means if you take the square root, you get a nice number back. Same thing with 64. The square root of 64 is 8. And that's where those two uh, terms come from in your binomial. The reason one's plus, one's minus is because it cancels out your middle term. B, y squared minus 6y plus 9. Once again, this is one of uh, the other ones we did, which is a perfect square trinomial. And your first and last terms are perfect squares, 9 and y squared. And then your middle term is 2 times each of those. So if this is the square root of y squared is y, and the square root of 9 is 3, then it's 2 times y times 3, which is 6y. So that means we can factor that into a binomial squared, y minus 3 squared. Part C, part C, we have 4x squared plus 4x plus 1. Let's take a look at this and let's see if this is also a perfect square trinomial. So 4x squared would be 2x, the square root of it. The square root of 1 is 1. So the first and last terms are perfect square. Is our middle term 2 times 2x times 1? And it is. It's 4x. So that means, once again, we can factor this into 2x plus 1 quantity squared. D, 5x squared minus 45. Now, you have two terms. It doesn't appear to be a difference of squares because you can't take the square root of 5x squared and get a nice value back. But if you look a little closer, we also notice that there is a common factor of 5. So if we use the distributive property, and we have 5 times x squared minus 9, now we do have a difference of squares on the x squared minus 9. So we can factor that into x minus 3 and x plus 3. Question 50. Simplify each expression below. Your answer should contain no parentheses and no negative exponents. So in part A, we have all of that being raised to the zero power. Anything raised to the zero power is 1. B, we have 25 raised to the 1 half times x to the fifth, and then 4x raised to the negative 6. So 25 to the 1 half, remember that is the square root of 25, times x to the fifth, times 4, times x to the negative fifth. So 5 times x to the fifth, times 4, times x to the negative 6. 5 times 4 is 20, and then you can add your exponents on x to the fifth and negative 6. And then we need to rewrite x to the negative 1 as 20 divided by x. Question C, 5t to the negative third power. Only the negative 3 goes to the t. So the 5 stays in the numerator, and the t to the negative 3 becomes t to the third and is in the denominator. And the last one, d. We have all of this stuff, x to the seventh, y to the third, over x raised to the one-third. So let's simplify inside. x to the 7th divided by x to the 1st would be x to the 6th. And then the 1 3rd is the cube root. We can also multiply each of these. So 6 times 1 3rd and y to the 3rd times 1 3rd. And they actually simplify, so we don't need to end up taking the cube root. So 6 to times 1 3rd is x squared, and 3 times 1 3rd is 1. Question 51, we want to solve the systems algebraically and then we'll graph them 
to confirm our solutions. So on A, we can use the equal value method. 4x plus 5 is equal to negative 2x minus 3, or 13. Add 2x, subtract 5, divide by 6, then we get x equals negative 3. Plug that into one of the two equations, y equals 4 times negative 3 plus 5. And that is y equals negative 12 plus 5, or negative 7. So the solution is negative 3 comma negative 7. Let's go ahead and graph each of these equations. 4x plus 5 has a y-intercept of plus 5 and a slope of 4. So we'll go up 4 over 1, down 4 to the left 1. And then we also have negative 2x minus 13. And I, I don't have negative 13 in my graph, so I'm going to have to just get some different values here so I can figure out where it's at. So I'm just going to plug in some points. If I plug in negative 2, I get negative 9. Negative 3, I get negative 7. Negative 4, negative 5. Negative 5, negative 3. And that'll give me enough to graph the line. And this is the equation y equals negative 2x minus 13. And we can see right here our solution is negative 3 comma negative 7. So we did confirm algebraically what we did get. Alright, and b, we're going to use substitution because y is equal to negative x plus 4, so we can plug that in to the y value. And solve for x. This would be x uh, plus 4 equals 9. Subtract the 4. We get x equals 5. Plug 5 back in. y equals negative 5 plus 4. And y is equal to negative 1. So the solution is 5, negative 1. And we'll confirm that by graphing y equals negative x plus 4. So plus 4. And then the slope is negative 1, so we'll go down 1 over 1 a couple times here. Graph the line. So this is y equals negative x plus 4. And the other equation is not in slope-intercept form, so I'm going to subtract 2x to both sides. Now we have the y-intercept at 9, and we can go down 2 over 1. So we can see right there that we have an intersection, and this is uh, y equals negative 2x plus 9, and it intersects right here, and this would be at negative 5, or not negative 5, sorry, positive 5, negative 1, and that confirms our solution as well. 52, consider the sequence 4, 8. Uh, if the sequence is arithmetic, write the first four terms in an equation and an equation in first term form. So if it is arithmetic, and we don't have enough information to say one way or another because there's only two terms, but if it is arithmetic, we are adding four. So the next four terms would be 12, 16, 20, and 24. Oh, it says write the first four terms. Well... Wow. I did a couple extra. There we go. Uh, and then an equation. So our equation in first term form would be t of n is equal to, we are adding 4, so 4 times, and then since we're doing first term form, n minus 1 plus 4 because the first term is 4. B now says if the sequence is geometric, do the same thing. So if it's geometric, 4... 8 means that you're multiplying by 2. So this would be 16, 32. And then the equation in first term form would be t of n. Your first term is 4. The multiplier is 2. And we'll raise that to n minus 1. 
Create another sequence that is neither arithmetic nor geometric and still starts with 4, 8. So, so for an example for C, we could just 4, 8, we could add 4, and then on the next one we could times it by 4. So that would be 32. And then on the next one we could add 4, and then times it by 4. So it would be 144. So the sequence would be 4, 8, 32, 36, 144, and so on. So it's not arithmetic, it's not geometric, uh, but still a sequence. Question 53, solve the following equations, 4x. So we have 4x minus 6y equals 20. So there's two variables here, so we're not going to get an actual value. We're just going to get an expression. So if we add 6y to both sides, we get 6y plus 20. And then we divide by 4. And so we have x is equal to 1.5 or 3 halves y plus 5. For b, we do have just one variable, so we will be able to solve. A couple different ways. We could distribute the 1 half. We could also multiply by 2 to cancel out the fraction. I'll go ahead and distribute the 1 half. And then add 3 to both sides. And then times it by 2, so x is equal to 24. On C, once again, we have one equation and only one variable. So once again, we will get a solution. Um, on this one, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the fraction. And to do that, I'm going to multiply by the common denominator of 5x. So each term gets multiplied by 5x. So I'll show this so you can see where these numbers are coming from. and then the 8 gets multiplied by 5x. So you'll notice that the 5 cancels, and you're left with 4x, plus the x cancels, you're left with 18 times 5, it's 90, and then 8 times 5x is 40x. Uh, so we can subtract the 4x now that we got rid of all the denominators. 90 is equal to 36x and then divide by 36, and x is equal to 2.5. And the last one, d, is an absolute value problem. So we do have to isolate the absolute value so that we can solve correctly here. So we will subtract the 2. So we have the absolute value of 2x minus 3. Remember, absolute value is the distance from 0. So in most cases, we have two solutions. Um, in this case, we will as well because the absolute value equal to 3 could be negative 3 or 3. So inside the absolute value, we can have two answers. We can have negative 3 because the absolute value of negative 3 is 3. And we also can have 3 because the distance from 3 is also 3. So if we add 3 and divide by 2, we get 0. If we add 3 and divide by 2, we get 3. So we have two solutions. x is equal to 0 and 3. Question 54. Mitchell likes to study the weather. He is fascinated by the sophistication of the computer models used to make weather predictions. Mitchell wonders if he can make his own model to predict the next day's high temperature in his area based only on today's high temperature. He selects 11 days at random and gets the temperatures from the internet. The results from his computer spreadsheet follow. So you can see here you're given the LSRL. You're given, so all this stuff is already calculated for you. Y is equal to 13.17 plus 0.85x. You're also given the correlation coefficient R. You have your scatter plot and the LSRL graphed for you. And then you also have your residual plot over here and then your data you have your independent variable the random day and the dependent variable um, the next day so you're going to answer questions based on this information uh, a through d so let's go ahead and take a look at the questions that are being asked 
Write a few sentences that describe the association. Remember to include interpretations of slope and r squared. So once again, I just pulled this from the answer key from, uh, from the book here and go through and kind of explain all the stuff that we know. So we know there's a strong positive linear association. Uh, we know that partly because of the r value. It's close to 1. Uh, we also can see that the line is increasing. So we know a strong positive linear association between the high temperatures on consecutive days in Mitchell's area. The random scatter plot in the residual plot or sorry, the red, I said that wrong. The random scatter in the residual plot confirms the appropriateness of using a linear, mo linear model. So because the data is scattered in the residual plot, it is a good model. An increase of one degree on any day is expected to increase the temperature the following day by 0 0.85 degrees Fahrenheit. That's your slope. So that's paying attention to the slope and talking about the change of y over the change of x. 86% of the variation in tomorrow's high temperature is explained by linear relationship with today's high temperature. And there are apparently no outliers. And remember, the 86%, that comes from your R squared value. So that was approximately 0 0.86, so rounded to 86%. Uh, part B, use the graph to estimate the largest residual. To what point does it belong? So the largest one looks to be up here. Uh, so on part B here, the answer key says the largest re residual value is about 17 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can see it's in between the 15 and the 20. And it belongs to the day after the 69.8 degree Fahrenheit day. And so remember, to find the 17 degrees, we want to take the, uh, the actual minus the predicted. So we have the um, the actual, that's the 69, or sorry, 89.6, and you would have to plug in 69.8 into your equation, y equals 13.17 plus 0 0.85 times 69.8, and that will give us a value of 72.2 rounded degrees Fahrenheit. And that's where you can take your actual 89.6 and subtract 72.2 to get 17.4, so degrees Fahrenheit. So that's where that number comes from. Yes, you can look at the graph, and it's somewhere in between 17 and 20. But if we want to get more accurate, we need to look at the, the actual minus the predicted. Uh, part C says, using the LSRL model, estimate tomorrow's high temperature based on today's high temperature of 55 degrees in Mitchell's area. Use appropriate precision. So you can see that they're taking the 55, plugging it in for your X value, and then the um, predicted temperature for the next day will be 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And then D, consider the upper and lower bounds of the prediction ma uh, Mitchell made in Part C above. Is Mitchell's model ready to replace the complex models of the professional meteorologist show your support? So it says the upper bound is given by y equals 30.17 plus 0.85x, and the lower bound is given by y equals negative 3.83 plus 0.85x. And so Mitchell predicts tomorrow's temperature will fall between 42.9 degrees Fahrenheit and 76.9 degrees Fahrenheit. So despite the strong relationship between the variables, Mitchell mo Mitchell's model is not very useful because, once again, looking at the spread here between the upper and the lower bounds, that's just way too much to make a, to make a good prediction. Uh, so his model is not going to be very useful. But it was a good attempt.